So I'm Dr. Lisa Lillianfield. I know most of you. This is Kaplan Center for Integrative Medicine. And welcome to our talk on hormone therapy um, research, myths and current research. And um, so we'll get started. I'd like to, uh, to wait for the, till the end for questions and just make sure to write down any questions you have and anything you don't understand so we can talk about it at the end. So, um, so let's imagine that we lived 100 years ago and the average lifespan was about 49, okay? Now the average lifespan is 78 for men and 80 for women. So what has happened in the last 100 years? Well, we have better medical care, we have less infant mortality, but what's really interesting is that the likelihood of reaching to 100 increases as time goes on. So a 50-year-old is 13 to 15% likely to reach 100. A 20-year-old is 30% likely to reach 100. So we have the branch of medicine called anti-aging or regenerative medicine. And this isn't about Botox and tuppy, tummy tucks. It's, it's the study of medicine on a molecular and cellular level. So it's how we can make our cells healthier and how we can slow the aging process. So what we practice here is something called functional medicine and that, that's part of anti-aging medicine is, function, is part of functional medicine. So mainstream medicine is disease oriented. You have a disease, you throw a drug addict, at it. Uh, functional medicine incorporates, looks at the genetics, it looks at environmental exposure, and it looks at lifestyle. So these are very much intertwined. Genetics, there's not a lot we can do about our genetics. There's maybe something we can do about environmental exposure. There certainly is something we can do about lifestyle. So functional medicine incorporates some of these modalities. Digestion, extremely important. So when I was a resident, we learned that babies that uh, were born to mothers that had allergy were most likely allergic to milk. And if you fed them milk-based formula, they would develop a permeability in the digestive tract where proteins would be absorbed. And they, may, they had a high risk of developing allergies themselves, the triad of asthma, allergic rhinitis, and eczema. So we recommended to mothers to feed their babies, if they had allergies, we recommend them to feed, feed them soy-based formulas. If someone has celiac disease, what does that do? That inflames the gut and it causes a leaky gut. Things are absorbed that should not be absorbed and nutrients are not absorbed. So there's a, malabsorb there's a malnutrition syndrome that occurs with something like celiac. If someone is on broad spectrum antibiotics for a long period of time, it wipes out the good bacteria. So then that sets up a milieu where you have overgrowth of bad bacteria or yeast. So digestion is ex ex extremely important for health. And this comes into nutrition as well. Obviously, if we're eating poorly, uh, we're going to talk about nutrition and its effects on the health later on. Sleep. OK, so sleep, we do know if you have sleep apnea, there's an increased risk of stroke and heart disease. If someone has a REM sleep deficiency, they have cognitive dysfunction. If one has, can, does not reach deep wave, delta wave sleep, they can have uh, pain syndromes like fibromyalgia and myofascial pain. So s we also know that uh, men, some men with sleep apnea tend to have low testosterone. So there's definitely correlations between all of this. Mental health. If we work 60, 80 hours a week and we have a boss that's a jerk, what happens? Our cortisol level goes up. This interferes with sleep. This causes weight gain. This causes uh, prediabetes. That predisposes to heart disease and cancer. Fitness, if, if we're not exercising, um, we run the risk of osteoporosis, of joint of injuries, um, of low lean muscle mass, which leads to prediabetes. And all intertwined in all of this is hormonal balance. So what about the brain? Let's take a little picture of the, of the brain. Um, so this is a very simplified picture of what our brain looks like. Um, so we have the very primitive brain called the reptilian brain. 
And you can think of a reptile. So what is a reptile? Um, reptile has fight or flight. It breathes. It gets hungry. Um, but it doesn't have any feelings. It doesn't have any thinking, right? Then we move on to the limbic system. This is where mostly what we're going to be, where we're going to be today. Um, the limbic system is where the hypothalamus and the pituitary sit, and this produces many of the hormones that stimulate other glands and hormones to produce their hormones. And hormones are messengers, so there's a lot going on in the limbic system. The neocortex is where we have higher thinking, executive function. So we share with primates, we share um, a prefrontal cortex where we have we can actually make decisions um, and, and think about our actions. Where are teenagers? Right here, okay? So the connection between the, the hormonal part of the brain and the prefrontal cortex, the higher thinking, is not fully formed well in, until well into their 20s. In boys, it's 25. In girls, it's about, they're about two years ahead of, ahead of boys. So when a, when a teenager makes uh, a, an impulsive decision, they aren't thinking. And this is a little bit more about the limbic system. So we have our hypothalamus, we have our pituitary, uh, we have our just a couple of other structures, the amygdala. This is really huge in boys. So this is stimulated by testosterone. There's a book that I, two books I highly recommend called The Female Brain and The Male Brain. And The Male Brain will tell you what, what testosterone does to the amygdala. Um, this is fear and aggression and sexual thoughts, et cetera. Um, we joke with our grandson about watching a football game. There are a bunch of amygdalas running up and down the field. That's exactly what it is. It's a good way to remember it. The hippocampus has to do with emotional memory. But we're mostly going to be talking about hormones coming from the hypothalamus and pituitary. So what are some of the hormones? Well, we won't go through all of these, and there are more. There are many, many more. We'll mostly be talking about estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, thyroid, a little bit about a cortisol. So estrogen and progesterone are in women, obviously even in girls, young girls, we, they have surges of estrogen and it actually changes their brain into a female brain. Um, at men arc, uh, when they start to have periods, they have surges of estrogen in the first half of the cycle, progesterone in the second half of the cycle. We find that there's more focus with the estrogen surge and there's more sedation with the progesterone surge. We'll go through that a little bit more later. Women have testosterone as well. And then obviously men, they don't have those cycles uh, like women do, but the testosterone starts even in utero. So by the time babies are born, they have testosterone brains already. Very different babies. Um, so, and then between age nine and 25, the testosterone in a boy will go up 25 times, um, and you know what that story is about. So <laughs> the, the testosterone in men peaks in the 20s and then plateaus, and after 30s or so, it starts to, to go down about 1 to 2% per year. 